All right, well, uh, let's start off with an intro here. Welcome, everybody, to the, uh, I don't know what the fuck this is, but it's something. Yeah, we'll find a name later. <laughs> unnamed as of yet. Yeah, unnamed as of yet. <laughs> we'll possibly be named later. Uh, we'll find out, I suppose. Well, I'm Rick. <laughs> I'm e House. I'm Craig. Uh, yeah, I'm interrupting. <laughs> I'm Craig. And I'm e House. There you go. And um, so, <laughs> what is our first topic going to be, gentlemen? We have a list here, and uh, let's start off with what we've been doing a lot of lately, and that's playing yeah. Payday. All right. Oh. My so God. there's the uh, free Hoxton DLC coming out on the tomorrow, actually on Monday, and I'm super excited for that shit. That's gonna be awesome. Oh yeah, I didn't realize that was coming out already. Whoa, what is it? Yeah. Um, it's a new DLC for Payday 2. You're going to be able to play as the old Hoxton, because the current Hoxton is actually Hoxton's replacement. Old Hoxton is in jail. And there's going to be another new character added, who I believe is named Nikita, but I don't think that's actually been confirmed yet. So that's going to be interesting. It's going to include a heist to basically huh. break Hoxton out of jail. Well, that's so that cool. Be cool. Yeah, a lot of people for a long time have been wanting a jailbreak uh, heist and we're finally going to get it. So, so, what about New Hoxton? Does he just get to eat shit? Um, I don't really know what they're going to do with New Hoxton. I think they're probably going to keep him on the crew. So, they're going to have it... Let's see, that's a total of seven characters now that you can choose from. So, it's a... Oh, that's cool. You have a little bit more variety. I would have honestly liked it if he had just gotten to eat shit because, uh, fuck him. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Although I can't, I can't say that. I, you play I do play as. as Hoxton. He looks pretty cool. Like I said, it looks like a mm. dude I'd like to party with with that weird mustache and whatnot. Yeah. So let's see. Is there anything old. else new in that DLC? I think it's just the characters in the heist. Well, I mean, and we, we obviously um, can't ignore the DLC you've been making use of. Which one? Which oh, one? you know which one. <laughs> the important one. The important DLC. Whoa! Oh, the of. John Wick one. The John Wick <laughs> yeah, one, of course. Of course. What do you think? Keanu Reeves about? DLC. Yeah. With the that was awesome. Fucking awesome suit and fucking <laughs> Keanu Reeves voice. <laughs> yeah, oh, that shit's hilarious. And then every time you fucking get revived, it's yeah. I guess I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> Just straight out of the movie. It's awesome. I love that shit. I wish they had an alternate skin of him where he was wearing one of his Emerson Knives T-shirts, but I guess it's a little much to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd have to be a it'd have to be a burger shirt though. Oh yeah, it would have to be a burger <laughs> shirt, of course. <laughs> Jesus Christ! So I am kind of excited to go see that movie. I, I do. Want yeah, to I see want to see. That. That I've too. been hearing pretty good things about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've heard that a lot. Should of good be stuff. another topic when we all get to go see. That it. That is a good call. That'll yeah, be, uh, that'll be a topic for Something next in week. The future. So, so we've been playing. I don't think I'll see it ne by next well, week. We'll but figure it in out in the near future. Fucking, you get the idea. Yeah, right? I'll see it someday. Yeah, <laughs> someday, but not today. <laughs> when it comes out. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we've been playing mostly stealthy in that game, and yeah, well, yeah, we did manage to have a bit of a problem with one of our pro jobs. <laughs> yeah, because just uh, a little. That game is really fucking hard on the harder difficulties, though, so... And uh, um, one person in this call might have uh, thrown a grenade. Because <laughs> 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 like, I was trying to switch yeah. to a rifle. a little rifle, bit of fat thumbs going there. It, it happens. <laughs> I fucking hit the three button and threw a goddamn grenade. <laughs> yeah, we've been fucking playing that bank heist mission so much that I, or so much that I'm starting to get like a huge XP penalty from it. It's like almost 10% down now. Really? Yeah, I have something like that God on damn. it too. Yeah, if you start to play a mission a ton, it starts to penalize you for XP, like all the way to the point where it doesn't give you XP anymore just to prevent players from farming. Ah, oh, well. Which is really silly. Yeah, we were, get, we were starting well, to get to that is, like, on the, you, uh, the jewelry heist. Yeah, because how else through. could you do to get the cards and the weapon cards and whatnot? That, that's the thing that always bugs me about video game logic is because, obviously, we all shoot and we all use guns, you don't have to unlock a red dot for your AR-15. You can go down to the store and buy one. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know. It'd be nice, but that would that would kind of kill any replay value, really. I also probably wouldn't be into guns if uh, it cost $140,000 to get a red dot sight, though. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ, are you kidding yeah. me? That would probably turn me off from guns forever. I mean, even with, you know, the <laughs> ATF... I mean, I already have expensive... Even with the ATF yeah. tax stamp process being what it is, I don't think it costs $300,000 for a suppressor, either. Well, we'll see you yeah. next year in New York. Well, you right. hold on, hold on, because it can't cost three hundred thousand dollars in New York because you can't get them. It's true. Yeah. So <laughs> they're so limited, you know. Yeah, so there you have is to get them like, on the black there market. There is no price on them because they literally do not exist in New York, according to Emperor <laughs> Cuomo. Yeah. <laughs> what we keep uh, mentioning when we play Payday, I I want a DLC where you can lock down an area with signs that say like "movie in progress" or something. You and know, it would make so much progress. sense with the Keanu Reeves DLC too. Yeah, it would, because I don't know if Keanu Reeves exists in that universe, but... I mean, he must. Uh, or I guess it would be John Wick in that universe, but you get the, you get maybe, the point. Maybe that's just uh, Keanu's, like, uh, alternate personality, you know? Like, I, I do. John Wick is just his second personality. That would uh, that would make a lot of sense. I mean, no one's ever seen the two of them in the same room together. Yeah, because John Wick is a lot like Keanu Reeves, you know? He used to do cool stuff, and now he kind of doesn't. And now and, he's getting uh, brought but back But he's starting to get back into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Like he says, I guess I'm back. <laughs> I, what, what, so. I like, what I like best, though, is like, I guess I'm back. It's like, or, or no, I think he says in the trailer, he's like, yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. So yeah, that, yeah. I, I know that's supposed to sound badass, but all I can think to myself is, okay, people keep asking if you're back. What time do you have to answer them between them asking you and you shooting them? Because <laughs> I don't, are you back? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm back. Because I haven't seen the movie, but you know, it, it definitely from the trailers looks like the type of movie where he's not wasting a lot of time carefully explaining his position. There's no, there's yeah, no probably debate. Not. He's not getting up to a podium and taking the time to lay <laughs> out his exact criteria for what he considers to be back. Yeah. I could see him doing that. <laughs> so there's a uh, something that I noticed. Have you guys seen the trailers? Like all the trailers for that movie? No. Not all of them. Just one or two of them. Okay, so there's one where uh, Keanu's, he's in this hallway, and I forget what the exact framing of it is, but he's talking to this uh, African-American character about, like, where do you get your dry cleaning done? And then the character says, like, oh, I don't think you could get those kind of stains out. And Keanu's like, bummer, dude. But the guy kind of looks like Giancarlo Esposito, who plays a character called the Dentist in some of the Payday 2 DLC. So I'm wondering if that's actually going to be a nod for Payday 2 or if that's just kind of a coincidence, you know? Yeah, because didn't they say that they were going to do, like, Keanu or John Wick is going to be in the DLC, but they're putting something from Payday into the movie? Yeah, be... what I think it might be is uh, it might be Chains because the actual backstory for John Wick in the game is that Chains uh, is an old friend of John Wick and John Wick's getting back into the yeah. game and he's asked for a favor and they're letting him into the crew. I, we'll we'll have to see the movie to uh, find out for sure, I guess. Who yeah. knows? We have to go watch Keanu Reeves shoot people. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, we have to watch him play a role he seems to enjoy playing. And that and that definitely, you know, going going in a kind of a weird direction. You can really tell when an actor is having fun with a role, and I think that makes it, that makes it better. Yeah, that usually makes it better when they enjoy what they're doing. They actually time and effort into actually performing it how they should i was gonna say and recently you know a recent example of that is uh because i've been playing the evil within and every voice actor in that game seems to have phoned it in except jackie yeah. earl haley who plays the <laughs> villain he plays yeah Weary. i heard the voice acting was pretty terrible yeah the voice that. acting in that game is awful all around in general but every time ruvik shows up or every time he says anything you could just tell that Jackie Earl Haley was loving it. Like he, uh, he, he says some, like, and some of the dialogue he's expected to say is kind of stupid and doesn't make any sense. You could tell it was just written to sound cool, and Jackie Earl Haley fucking loves it. You mean like all of Leon's <laughs> lines from Resident Evil Four? Yeah, except I don't remember who voice acted him because it was was it Nolan North? Because I think he did Leon in Resident Evil Six. No, it's not Nolan North. But yeah, but but for example, there's one line that sounds 
awesome. It was in the trailers, and you can kind of tell it was written for the trailers. And at one point, Ruvik walks up to your character. He's like, are you going to be able to live with yourself knowing what I'm going to make you do? And just like the way Jack Earl Haley delivers that line, just like sends chills down your spine. Doesn't make any goddamn sense in the context of the story because it doesn't really come back ever again. But it sounds <laughs> fucking awesome the way Jack Earl Haley delivers it. So, like I said, you know, you'd really tell when someone's loving what they're doing. Yeah, um, I just looked it up. The voice actor for Leon from Resident Evil 4 is Paul Mercier, or Mercier, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. But um, it's just something that always stuck with me from Resident Evil 4 was that he kind of seemed to be trying to make the line sound cool, like Leon probably would try to do. But just, like, they all fell flat. Oh, yeah. And that made so many of them so memorable. Like, when, uh, just in the beginning, when he's in the village and they all hear the bell and they start walking in, he's like, where's everyone going, <laughs> bingo? It's like, <laughs> just yeah, a bunch of stupid, silly lines in that game. But that's what I loved about it, because Resident Evil 4 was definitely self-aware enough to pull mm-hmm. that off. And I've heard a lot of parallels between Resident Evil 4 and, uh, what is it, the Evil Within? Yeah, Evil Within. Um, the difference being that the evil within lacks the self-awareness to pull it off entirely. Be- because that's the thing. Like, Resident Evil 4, you had the silly cult leader who, f- come to find out, was voiced by one of the guys who did a ton of the Nords in Skyrim, which is where I recognized his voice again years later. Yeah. Oh, crap. <laughs> I never noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I-, I was playing the Resident Evil 4 again, like, a couple months ago, and I'm like, man... Where the hell have I heard this voice since then? <laughs> and I looked it up, and he did tons of the Nords in Skyrim. And I'm like, I fucking knew it. He sounded just like it. Yeah, that's Michael Go. Yeah. Yeah, Michael Go. <laughs> he sounds awesome. And, and he was another one of the voice actors in that game. Like, you could tell. He was just it, cheesy, ridiculous, stupid, bad voice acting. But he was having so much fun with it, you didn't care. <laughs> and... And the like the dialogue that Leon and Salazar and Sadler had, like your right hand comes off, <laughs> just shit like that was yeah, so just great. like stuff that seems like it was probably lost in translation or just the Japanese writers didn't know how that was gonna really translate into English, you know? And it's yeah, just... but then it just came out sounding just like man, that's like, <laughs> like so cheesy. It came across as self aware and intentionally cheesy. Yeah, but the thing is, and like the evil within tried to be so serious in a lot of ways that it really lacked that. Yeah. Like it, it tried to be serious, but with that air of self-awareness and it just didn't click. Yeah. And it, and I, I liked the evil within you. I, I, I thought it was a good game. I liked a lot of what it did, but I am definitely the person who's going to come right out and say, even though I enjoyed this game, it is deeply flawed. Yeah. So just coming out of outlast, you wouldn't say it's really very scary. No, well, it, it has a very good atmosphere, and I think overall the Evil Within's atmosphere holds up pretty well comparatively to, uh, it's difficult, because I'd say it's as consistent for the most part as Silent Hill 2 minus a few chapters, because it definitely keeps a very good surreal aesthetic going for the entire game, but it falls flat in terms of delivering consistent scares because a few of the chapters can't seem to decide on a tone. Like you, I'll get you'll get into a chapter and you'll have just come out of you know some really claustrophobic and you know experience, and then you'll be in the sunlight fighting a bunch of enemies in a big action set piece. It's like, man, what? Yeah, wasn't there a time when a zombie comes by and does a <laughs> drive by? Like, okay. There is a pretty major segment of the game, two pretty major segments of the game, uh, not to spoil too much, but there are two fairly major segments of the game where you are on a 50 caliber machine gun on a Humvee, because apparently there are Humvees in this game with 50 caliber machine guns that zombies can drive. Oh, there you go. And, and I guess they're not zombies, they're the <laughs> haunted, um, and the haunted never really had an adequate explanation for them. On the one hand, uh, they hinted that the haunted were victims of Ruvik who were, you know, plugged into his mind. But on the other hand, there weren't enough victims to make that happen. And you wondered what the whole deal was. Um, So the story, I wouldn't say, was especially strong. But I enjoyed the overall aesthetic. The first few chapters especially felt like Splinter Cell met 
Alan Wake met Resident Evil 4, and it really did feel like a very nicely crafted stealth horror experience. Mm -hmm. And then after Chapter 4, I would say, it kind of nosedives off and becomes, you know, an enjoyable action horror game, but it kind of lost what I really enjoyed about it. Yeah, something that, like, this is probably just a petty concern about or whatever, but one of the things that really turned me off from The Evil Within was the fact that it's... And I know they did this to establish, like, a cinematic kind of view, but it's third person. I really... The bars. Yeah, I really wanted it to be first person, but instead they made it third person with the bars. It's like, why? Well, there's a theory going that the bars were due to a uh, re a uh, resolution issue yeah. with uh, the consoles. I'm not sure if that's true. I haven't really looked into it, but I wouldn't be entirely shocked. Yeah, it's like possibly a happy accident kind of deal. Yeah, but, but the other issue is too, like, I don't, I'm not a perspective whore. A lot of people get very, uh, very tied up in they prefer first person, they prefer third person. I don't really care either way. I just think that it needs to be done well, whatever you go with. And the bars were very annoying. You stop noticing them after a while, but they were limiting in terms of how you could see up and down and made some parts of the game feel cheap when there would be traps on the ground that you would have difficulty seeing right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And that was the other issue with the game. A lot of parts of it felt very cheap. Um, Speaking of that, one of my coworkers, um, she actually got it from Redbox. Oh no, she bought it. They were going to get it from Redbox, but uh, we were out of it. But she decided about half an hour in that she couldn't take it anymore because just of how cheap the game feels. Mm, that's not good. Because cause it's, it's, it's like Resident Evil 4 where it limits ammo, but on top of that, it's really difficult to kill or at least defeat the haunted without using ammo. So it never, she said it never found a balance and it usually well, just left her frustrated and angry with it. Well, that was where the stealth came in. Um, the stealth came it. in and the fact that you were so limited with your ammo and your resources to an all, I mean, to a pretty absurd yeah. degree. I mean, you could only carry starting out six extra shells for your revolver. And I'm like, man, come on. Uh, 32 or 38 special ammunition is not that burdensome that you can't stuff 12 or 15 shells in your pocket. Well, another thing that I've been hearing is that once you get to the city section of the game, like the enemies, you know, they were difficult at first when you're in the forest section and, you know, like you have to be quiet about killing them so you don't alert all of them. But once you get into the city section, like this IGN -ish, uh, article right here says, the evil within fails to feel threatening at every turn in the city section. Sebastian is so empowered oh, yeah. that it robs the evil within of any tension in combat. And, and that was that was an issue was the RPG leveling elements definitely did a disservice to the uh, to the difficulty of the game because it but to be fair you were so disempowered starting off that it was absurd mm -hmm. you know just like amnesia or outlast where hey there's these dudes yeah like it never it never actually strikes a balance between uh survival and it just seems like it doesn't uh, have any like it doesn't have any plans for a long-term horror. It wants to suck you in with some like intense moments in the beginning and just go like, okay, we've met our scare quota. Have fun with the rest of the game. Yeah, it kind of feels like it's a... Uh... Well, it was a game that couldn't decide what it wanted to be. Yeah, like it just had no idea. It dabbled too much in too many things, but never really succeeded in any of them. Yeah, and, and like I said, you know, I'm, I'm saying all this and I'm criticizing the game now. I do think if you're a hardcore, old-school, action horror game fan, you'll probably enjoy it. But I am, you know, saying all these things because the game definitely... Because I think they want to make a franchise out of this. I got that feeling from the, from the marketing and from all the stuff they said about it and from the ending of the game. They definitely want to make a franchise out of The Evil Within. So Shinji Mikami and Bethesda, you will probably never hear this ever. But... Shinji Mikami and Bethesda, here's what I'm going to tell you to do to make The Evil Within 2 better than The Evil Within 1. Number one, stick to what you did well in the first couple chapters, and even a couple of the later chapters, I think, did pretty well with a tense, claustrophobic atmosphere with scarce resources, and your character was very disempowered. So stick with that, and don't focus on the action stuff. Uh... 
Another thing is get rid of the fucking cinematic bars. Those suck. Mm-hmm. No one I know has said that those were a good thing. Yeah. At most, they're neutral towards them. So you're not going to piss anyone off by getting rid of them. In any game I've ever encountered those kind of cinematic bars in, the first thing I do is always try to find a way to turn them off. They're just obnoxious. And yeah. you can't. There is Didn't no Metal option Gear Solid 4 have them? Off. I think it did. I think Metal Gear Solid 4 had them. I mean, you could As turn them option, off. You could turn them yeah. off. And that was the thing, is you would turn them off because you didn't fucking like them. Yeah. It's a video yeah. game, not a movie. Yeah, yeah well, I think Assassin's Creed um, Unity is actually going to try to do that too. Where they said they're locking it for consoles on a certain resolution. Well, they said uh, that was cinematic certain frames per second, not resolution. They're locking no, it. No, it's to locked 30. to a certain resolution too. Really? Yeah. Huh. For consoles, it's locked to a certain resolution. And I think that's the thing, too, is I think a lot of games these days are being hobbled into making design to choices like that because consoles are so desperate to keep up with parity with, you know, between the consoles and between console and PC that they're interfering more and more in the development process, you know, as they send out their dev kits and with, uh, you know, paying and trying yeah. to, you know, send them money, you know, for the development of the game and say, hey... We're going to send you this dev kit. We're going to send you, you know, this much money to make the game, but you need to do these certain things. And I won't claim to be some inside source in the gaming industry, but I mean, obviously, we've seen a lot of examples. There was a huge uh, outcry recently because I forget what game it was. I actually think it was Assassin's Creed where there was a lot of money paid by Microsoft to Ubisoft in order to keep parity between the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 versions of the game. They didn't want the PlayStation 4 version to look better, even though it would, yeah. because the PlayStation 4 has better hardware. Arguably, yeah. The It is kind of important to note that the Xbox One does have similarly powerful uh, internals, it, I believe. Well, Doesn't the Xbox it, One have NVIDIA as their no, graphics card? No, use AMD. No, yeah. Um... The Xbox One, I've been hearing not from developers that the PS4 vastly overpowers the Xbox One. You know what one. it might be, too, is not even raw technical specifications that makes the PS4 more powerful. Because if you recall correctly, last generation, the PS3 was the more powerful machine again. But they had a bottleneck in the way the hardware worked where they... Yeah, because, yeah, because of the of coding. The coding and it was more difficult to develop for because you can have the most powerful goddamn hardware in the world. But if your machine isn't totally dedicated to gaming like the Xbox One and becomes difficult to develop for, then that doesn't matter. Yeah, so what I was remembering about the uh, differences in the specifications for their hardware is that the Xbox One has a processor that's one or it's a 0.15 gigahertz faster than the PlayStation 4's processor. But the PlayStation 4's GPU is over 50% more powerful than the Xbox yeah. One's. Yep. So. so overall, the... Slightly more slightly more processing power for the Xbox One, but overall you're having a better potential gaming experience out of the PlayStation 4, most likely. And that's all comes down to Xbox trying to do the whole TV and the whole entertainment wrapped into one thing, whereas the PlayStation's like, hey, this is what we are. We're a gaming system. We're not gonna. We're not gonna say anything about it. Yeah, the Xbox One's trying to do that uh, home entertainment system as opposed to just a game console. Which well, is the what thing it with be. that is, it's weird that Xbox decided to go with the all-in-one entertainment platform because I'm honestly surprised they didn't look at their sales from the Xbox 360. And the Xbox 360 had Netflix and whatnot, but their sales were mostly from the hardcore gaming audience. Yep. And now they've lost that because they pissed everyone off. Yeah, everybody's brought that up as uh, they've kind of lost touch with their main focus group and their attempts to <clears throat> get more money from the kind of fringe groups that they're trying to do with the Xbox One. And now most people are disappointed and they're, they have to use... Um, they have to use exclusives like Halo and... The timed exclusive Tomb Raider because... Yeah, yeah, that too. Because they have no other way to sell consoles. Yeah, they're really... like uh, Even at the original Xbox One conferences, they were talking about they're really trying to move the console with exclusives. So they're starting a whole bunch of new IPs for that console. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, that's awesome. And I, 
and new IPs and exclusives sell consoles more than anything else. But if you lose touch with your your main focus group, you're not going to get that money to begin well, with. Well, the biggest yeah, thing exactly. that Microsoft lost was the goodwill of their consumer base. The way they handled the Xbox One and the way their PR department and you know the guy obviously on Twitter... The way they handled the announcing of the Xbox One and its features uh, killed a lot of people's goodwill and actual well, the thing desire is, to get I an Xbox I think they could one. have recovered from the initial announcement focusing mostly on the entertainment feat of uh, well, the multimedia they entertainment. Could I have. think they could have recovered from that. The issue is then they had their guy on Twitter telling people to deal with it. And you know, then they had all these different announcements that they would not budge on these issues and yada yada yada. So the the thing is they really thought they could push around their consumer base but their consumer base was not happy about it. And PlayStation, in a stroke of genius, decided, hey, well, Microsoft just played Russian roulette with a semi-automatic handgun, so how about we go over and piss on the corpse <laughs> a little bit? And that was why we got the video with the CEO of GameStop with the CEO of Sony. Here's how you share games on the PlayStation 4. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Something I have to say that Microsoft did kind of well with their Xbox One release, though, is that it doesn't have the Red Ring of Death like the Xbox 360 had. It doesn't well, yeah, to have they, a huge release. Well, it, it has had some issues. Well, it hasn't been issue-free. Um, with the launch, but it's not to the extent of the Red Ring of Death. There have been hard drive issues. There's been uh, disk drive issues. But nothing that causes your entire system to brick and you have to RMA it. Yeah, no launch is problem free, but compared to the numbers for the Xbox 360 that encountered Red Ring of Death problems either out of the box or a few months down the line, they've yeah. been doing a lot better with that. And I think their customer yeah, support has also probably better. improved from that generation. Well, as well, well, I think part mm -hmm. of it too was because they knew, I mean, that Microsoft, as much as I think they are, they aren't stupid. Um, Microsoft. Realized that if they had another Red Ring of Death scandal on their hands, I don't think the Xbox brand could have survived a second terrible launch. Especially after the reception that the one got from E3 yeah. as well. Crashing to Windows 7 desktop. <laughs> yeah, if it, if it had as many problems as the 360 did on launch, uh, that that whole section probably would have disappeared. Yeah. yeah. Like if it, yeah, if it had been a launch problem, like, like the red ring on top of them trying to totally alienate their previous user base by like changing mm -hmm. the purpose of the console, then yeah, that, that probably would have killed Microsoft for the game console industry. Their, yeah. uh, their new CEO, I don't remember what his name is, but he was hired uh, within the past year. He's actually trying to get Microsoft to go, I, I don't know if this is still current, but he was saying that he's trying to get Microsoft to go back toward, like, office programs as opposed to gaming. And he might be trying yeah. to get Microsoft to completely drop gaming as a whole. Why? Um, they... I don't really remember the reason that he gave. Let me see if I can try to find it. I mean, I'm sure, you know, this guy is some kind of market analyst, but it seems to me like gaming is such a growing sector... Because the, the thing is, over the past 30 years, gaming has done nothing but get bigger. So I don't really know what the logic is for that. I mean, maybe if the Xbox brand is having a sufficient drop-off, they're saying, okay, listen, this really isn't working out how we hoped, yada, yada, yada. But I, the gaming sector as a whole has only been growing for the past 30 years. And, you know, the largest media launches in history at this point have multiple times been video games. So to argue that getting out of the gaming sector would be a good idea strikes me as counterintuitive. So the uh, CEO of Microsoft I was talking about, his name is Satya Nadella, and he's trying to get Microsoft to drop the Xbox, Bing, and the Surface tablets. Uh, he's trying to eliminate what he and his, uh, his shareholders basically view as non-essential product lines. Because they want Microsoft to focus on their core strengths, which is selling enterprise software to businesses. Yep. Uh, they feel that there's more money in that than there is in gaming, and they basically feel like they're... It's not that they're not making good money, it's that they're not making enough money, or as much money as they'd like to be. HP is doing the same thing. Um, since I work in the photo well, lab, 
Uh, what hand did HP have in gaming? Yeah. <laughs> well, just listen to this. Um, I work in the photo lab, uh, but we actually, just within the last two weeks, have switched completely from uh, an HP photo lab to Naritsu, which is from... Uh, uh, I forget... I forget who it's actually based from, but HP is getting out of the photo business because the exact same reason they are moving to their main uh, main product lines and main source of money and getting rid of all this. I think Microsoft would would almost be stupid to do the same thing. The Surface tablet sure doesn't sell as well as the iPad. However, it has a very large following in um, more of the technical business practices and uh, more uh, the hands-on groups. Um, not like artists and stuff like that who want to use the iPad for their uh, artsy and things like yeah, that. For their like tablet well, drawing. And for the yeah. everyday yeah. user. I mean, most everyday yeah, users the, are more familiar and, with the iPad at this point. Yeah, and the great thing about the Surface, though, is the Surface is a an actual laptop replacement tablet, whereas the iPad is not. So people lurk, looking for a laptop replacement are going with that. So if Microsoft were to drop that, they would lose all those sales. Um, sure, it's not going to sell as well as their main stuff, but their main stuff is more marketed towards companies and people who bulk buy lots and lots of stuff well my question for What's... them is this my question is because i don't again i don't claim to be an industry analyst but my question is if they're making money in their other sectors which they probably are if they're still doing them in what way is that detracting from their core business because microsoft is a huge company and I don't think, I mean, I think that's the understatement yeah. of the year that I just said right there. I think that's pretty obvious to anyone. But Microsoft is a huge company. So are they losing out on their core business by having these other divisions in addition to them? Um, that would be my question. Well, what they're probably, what they're probably figuring is if they redirect the gaming uh, aspect of their company into more advanced and more innovative office uh, you know, kind of business supplies, basically business programs, then they'll probably make more money on these business programs because they'll basically just have a higher volume to sell. And if you do look at the actual prices for like Microsoft Word and Excel and all those packs, like I know back in the day, they used to be around like it was like three or four hundred dollars to buy just a couple of the programs and then it cost more to buy the suite. So they're making a lot of money off of those programs. But yeah. you could potentially sell multiple copies of an entire suite to one person, but you're probably not going to sell one person multiple Xbox Three or uh, Xbox That's ones. true. That's true. So that could be what they're thinking. That, that is true, and I and I suppose that is a uh, that is a good way of looking at it. And again, you know, like I said, I uh, I am not infallible in this. That would just be my question: is is this a zero sum game? You know, are you are you losing out on this market share because you also want to have this market share? Yeah, exactly. So it's just, you know, like like you keep saying, I'm also not a business analyst or some businessman or something, but it just seems kind of weird that they might be moving toward dropping all this interesting stuff that keeps them in competition with Apple and just focusing on what they used to do. And, yep. and that's the other thing, too, is I hope they don't do that, not even because I necessarily like the products they offer. I hope they don't do that simply because competition is is the backbone of capitalism and yeah if and you eliminate all it, that competition you're gonna have some problems yeah and if they leave those markets what's gonna fill the void either yeah, a knows. competitor or someone else but if if that happens you're gonna the lose atari 4200 <laughs> <laughs> yeah atari's coming back baby i would love to see an atari <laughs> console Apple. considering that their last thing that got any degree of attention was that horrific Alone in the Dark game from 2006. <laughs> oh my god, that game, dude. God, I just remember playing that game, and in the beginning you gotta make your guy blink, and I was just like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that dropped off as the game went on, but it was just like, holy crap, I don't need to be telling my character how to blink. I was gonna say, I wish that game had been better, but unfortunately, it was not to be. No. I was, I was gonna say, speaking of games that I don't understand why... Uh, they are is that new one that just got shown off um, 
I can't think of what its name is, but it hatred. Hatred. Yes. That one we've been talking about. <laughs> yeah. I I don't understand why this is a thing. <laughs> uh, especially at this point in time. Hatred is one of those games I've been following a little bit just because I was curious about it. And the developer says it's a response to the political correctness movement, he calls it, within video gaming of always, you know, you play the good guy and, you know, you're killing the bad guys and whatnot. And he's like, oh, you know, violence in video games is too clean these days. And, you know, we're taking it back to what it is. And you play as a guy who's killing people for fun because that's what you're doing. To which I say, okay, that's a that's a valid point, but... uh. You're kind of late to the party, bro, because Postal came yeah, out yeah, 20 years really. ago. It's absolutely a valid point. However, going about it the absolutely wrong way. And this it, and this time period with all the events that are going on, this probably wasn't the best idea. Couldn't you make the same argument for Grand Theft Auto, though? Because Grand Theft Auto could, 5... But Grand Theft Auto is very disguised on it's, how they do it. This is just true, very but... blatant, out in the open... Well, I mean, let's not ignore that Grant... I mean, we're saying this and acting like Grand Theft Auto never had a chair of controversy. I mean, come on now. Yeah, like, seriously. Jack Thompson called it a murder simulator, which, I mean... And that's the thing. Video games, at their core, require a certain level of cognitive dissonance. Because... Yes. We can look at a video game where we shoot people or rob banks, you know, as we've been doing in Payday 2, and we can think... This is fun mm-hmm. in the context of this video game. These are things that we like to do. You know, these are good yeah. things. You know, us stealing the money and shooting the police officers. But then in real life, obviously, you know, none of us have any kind of rap sheet. And none of us want to have any kind of rap sheet or, you know, want to hurt anybody. So it's a it's two conflicting beliefs held simultaneously. It's within the game, we want to kill people. In real life, we'll do everything we can to avoid that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not something a rational person wants to do. So it's it's just a separation of fantasy and reality. Most kids are taught that very early, but a lot of parents are disconnected. So that's where you get kids playing this game and they're like, oh man, I could do this in real life. And that's where I think something like Payday is going to succeed where um, it's there's a big enough disparity between the game and real life. Whereas the, with all the things that are going on, it hatred kind of strikes me as someone saying hey here let me allow you to video make this a video game so you can see what it'd be like for you to do it not in the same kind of way as like payday the thing is hatred isn't gonna be like active shooter simulator 2014 like it's it's not gonna be like that it's uh it's obviously a very arcadey like top-down type shooter uh, it almost looks like gauntlet you know it's, it's a lot in the same vein as hotline miami yeah and you know you in reality you can't just go grab a gun and run into a police station and fight a whole bunch of police officers in their main lobby and expect to win yeah but in this since it's a video game you can do that and, and that's my thing with hatred i don't i honestly don't think it's going to have the uh response that they're looking for because yeah so many games have come out doing the same fucking thing the only thing that's different about hatred is that it is marketed explicitly as that yeah and it doesn't seem to have like a different main goal like the big defense for gta like i said earlier that a lot of people have been using is that in grand theft auto you know you're you're supposed to do you know certain criminal elements sometimes you have to carry out a hit sometimes you have to fight gangs or like rival gangsters or something but they fired first or they're yeah. a rival and you have to take them down in order to establish like dominance in that area that's what that happens a lot in like saints row but hatred is different because it's not saying you know you have to do all of these things so you can become like higher up in the ranks or get more money yeah, or whatever these things hatred they're Yeah, Hatred's mission statement is the main character says, I think it's time for me to kill everybody and for me to die too. So it's just a much different thing from Grand Theft Auto, but I just, I like to bring up Grand Theft Auto as a counterpoint because it's not like there has never been a video game where you can just mass murder tons of people. Well, it's Grand Theft Auto, it's postal. Like I said, Grand Theft Auto is very well disguised for what it is. Um, yeah. The, yeah, you obviously can do that, but that's not what the game is about. 
Well, in in Grand Theft Auto, the you know you're supposed to advance the story and whatnot, and when you just go off and kill everybody, it's kind of you messing around and not doing the main point of the game. Exactly. Hatred, the violence is its own reward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, killing a lot of people in uh, Grand Theft Auto Five is normally accompanied by having swarms of police show up and uh, kill you or take you into custody. So. Okay. And and the other thing with uh, with hatred though. In the way that it says that it's a response to, oh, you know, you always play the good guy in the video games. Your actions are always justified. You know, you never have to acknowledge that you're just killing a lot of people for fun. I would say, sir, Spec Ops The Line came out two years ago and honestly did what you're trying to do much, much better. Yeah. Spec Ops was a fantastic um, look into the psychological aspect of it, whereas... This one is not going to be. Well, well, the thing is, like, I and again, I don't have a problem with hatred being made. Obviously, I am a, uh, I am what I would describe as a civil libertarian. I don't care. You can do what you want. I just think that you're not going to have the artistic merit you think you're going to, because until you start defining cognitive dissonance in your loading screens or asking how many Americans have you killed today, you're not going to have the same level of emotional impact that Spec Ops did. Yeah, I wish I had anything to say on Spec Ops, but I've never played it. Oh my <laughs> so, god, man. You Come need on, to. You need to. <laughs> it's pretty good. Spec Ops? Okay, but let me, let me I say. I never it. finished it because I got stuck on a part where this helicopter decides to shoot through a window. Well, the checkpoint was literally right seconds before that, and for whatever reason, my guy was stumbling. So, every single checkpoint, my guy is stumbling, and the helicopter just guns him down immediately. So, I just got stuck there. But up to that point was fantastic. Well, because, I mean, obviously that was right after the gate. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing. I I think Spec Ops does a good job of bringing you back to Earth in the context of the cartoonish violence that you're committing in this game. I mean, you're blowing up. Uh, satellite TV or radio station, you know, you're mowing down masses of soldiers, you're, and then you have, you know, the gate scene where it's just like every Call of Duty scene that has, you know, where you're up in the UAV and shooting down, it's just like that, every single fucking Call of Duty has that scene, and it's a perfect recreation of that until you go down and you walk through hundreds of burned and disfigured screaming in pain bodies and finally mm-hmm. you realize that the very people you were there saying you were going to save the civilians you kill all of them too yeah from what i heard it's like it's a it's a really good game that shows you kind of an example of this kind of stuff in video games can happen and does happen but that doesn't mean that it should happen yeah and it's and it's very good and that's the game really that I think demonstrates better than any others is the level of cognitive dissonance needed to play violent video games because yeah, I would, I love playing, you know, modern shooters where, you know, you're the soldier and you're saving all the, you know, all the good guys and you're mowing down the bad guys. But then spec ops comes along and says, yeah, but then you put that into a different context. You know, you, you show up and you really don't know what's going on. And that's the thing with video games is you get a very limited snapshot of the context of the world that you're in because you show up in medias res in so many cases. And with, uh, with Spec Ops versus like Call of Duty, um, Call of Duty, there's no such thing as um, military intelligence being wrong. It, it's go shoot the bad guys. Oh, maybe if you go through a street in some third world country, don't shoot the civilians. Spec Ops, you go, you have no idea what's going on. You have no idea what you're up against. You have no idea what's going to happen around the corner. Whereas with Call of Duty, it's on a rail, so around the corner there's a bunch of guys. Yeah, like around the, corner more. The, the Humvee scene in the beginning of uh, Modern Warfare 2, I think it was, where you have the, uh, the GAU-8 and you're on the back of the... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, like uh, you know, there's civilians and stuff at the beginning, and you're you're physically unable to actually shoot your gun. And uh, once you get out of that area, suddenly every single person is a terrorist with an RPG or an AK, and they're trying to kill you. And you can literally just fire into into at one point an actual school building that just happens to be full of terrorists with no kids in. Yeah. 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 No kids. No teachers. No innocent people. Just terrorists. 
And, you know, going back to, again, hatred is the thing. There are so many examples of video games pulling off really shocking violence, but you don't even think about it. You don't even think about the fact, oh, I'm fighting through a school yeah, in some they're old all, country. they're all the bad guys, quote-unquote. Yeah. So I, th- I do think hatred is a point that a lot of video games, you know, dress up violence a lot and make it like, hey, you know, this is, you know, this is all justified, this is all fine, this is all cool, but I think that's required because otherwise it, it's disgusting. Yeah. So that, that kind of just brings up the question, is hatred, like, is it intentionally just existing to say, look, you've done this in every other game, now we're telling you to do it, this is no different from anything else, why are you freaking out? Is that their whole message? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm curious how it will be pulled off. Now, I doubt very much, because like I said, the trailer definitely did not show any kind of artistic depth. It seemed very desperate, it seemed very attention grabby, but it didn't seem deep. No, yeah, it seemed a lot more shock value of, whoa, this is what's yeah, it, happening. Then so much shock actually, value. Yeah, I'm here to prove. A, I'm here to prove a point. Yeah, three edgy five me. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Um, but again, we will find out when the game comes out. Uh, I really don't think it deserves all the controversy that has. And, and that's the funny part too. The controversy around hatred has not shown up in the mainstream media. Not yet. It has shown well, up on yet. IGN and Kotaku and stuff, but if you're not yeah, a gamer, you're not watching in that. gaming publications, if you are not a gamer, you have no idea what hatred is. Mm-hmm. You don't know what exists. And I feel like the kind of shock value they were going for was they were trying to shock the media and whatnot, but I think the media is so numb to it because there have been so many gaming controversies that ended up being much ado about nothing. Mm. Yeah, I think once this gets closer to release, we're going to hear a lot more about it in the media. Its release date is quarter two of 2015, so we won't probably hear, you know, like weird articles about it on the news or anything until much closer to that time. Yeah. Because right now it's still in development. One of my, uh, one of my friends, one of my friends, uh, my buddy Kyle, I was talking to him about it. One of the things he said, which actually is kind of unfortunately true, is he did say, "Yeah, but the problem is." This is gonna be this is gonna become the talking point for the NRA the next time there's a school shooting. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Well, the NRA is gonna hate this game, and they're gonna wish it didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, well, the NRA can hate a lot of things and wish they didn't exist. Does the NRA have a background of like being anti-game violence? The NRA has a background of blaming, uh, of wanting to shift the blame to media violence, like after Sandy Hook. They wanted more investigations into video game violence and whatnot. Mm. Uh, they were one of the groups that pointed out that the Columbine shooters played Doom. So they are definitely, uh, they definitely have a history of trying to pass the buck in terms of when everyone says, oh, the NRA, this is your fault, which in itself is a stupid point, mm. but we'll try not to get too political. Um, yeah, something that I thought was interesting that, uh, destructive did with uh, hatred and this is pretty much my last point on it is that like you said the nra tried to tie doom into the columbine shooting saying that they trained with doom or whatever even though anyone who's ever played doom knows that that is a co- like a completely unrealistic depiction of how firearms work yeah but the, aka bold-faced lie. yes but the hatred <laughs> logo if you actually look at it it's spelled in the same exact font as the doom logo is it's cracked and decayed but it's the same font yeah. So they're trying to play off of that Columbine shooting kind of feel with this, I think. And that's just, it's kind of a weird decision because that's kind of, you know, breaching the boundary between as a concept and as a real life, co- like, consequence as a, a consequence of doing, uh, playing these kind of games, you know, like you will go crazy in real life and go shoot up a school or something. It's just kind of a, a weird kind of similarity to throw in there, in my opinion. Yeah, and the funny thing is, too, just, you know, talking about that kind of stuff, people are like, oh, video games make you crazy, video games make you violent. It always, it always makes me laugh my ass off because there's not a shred of actual psychological evidence to support that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There is no study that says that. Most studies say the exact opposite. Uh, there was one study, I think you might remember I joked about it, where they actually had people play violent video games and... Then they said something like, uh, I don't remember exactly, it was a while ago, like this was a solid year ago, and it was like, violent video games actually make players more contemplative of their actions, 
And uh, I joked, yeah, but if they made him play Spec Ops the line, that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I really don't think Hatred has too much of a solid point to make, but you know, that's, we'll find out yeah. when the game releases. Yeah, it'll be uh, interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, I feel like it's either going to be this major thing like people are like oh my god this game actually you know has something to say or it'll just be like yeah this game thinks it's more than it is and it sucks yeah Mm -hmm. i don't think there's gonna be a middle ground on it i think it'd be interesting if they threw in some kind of weird twist into the game just to be like oh you bought this game so you must be a violent a-hole or something right before it starts yeah (laughs) i was gonna say something along those lines um with the whole uh spec ops and uh, spec off the line and not knowing what you're what's going on um in those third world countries that you get deployed to as a soldier is uh, uh the new movie um american sniper which i am really wanting to go see i am also pretty excited for that um i i, I the trailer yeah definitely i was gonna say you've seen the trailer the right attention yeah i saw the trailer craig um, I haven't seen it yet. I've kind of been avoiding that movie. You should see the trailer. Why have you been um, avoiding it? Um, okay, that's the one about Chris Kyle, right? Yes. Okay, everyone who I know who is interested in Chris Kyle either really, really likes him and, you know, mourns his loss and everything, or really hates him and are totally into Jesse Ventura and their conspiracy theorists and stuff. So it's like every time someone mentions something about this, I just go like, nope, 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 and just back away slowly. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> I can't really say I have an opinion one way or the other on Jesse Ventura as a person, given I've never met him, but some of his theories are pretty crazy. And I'm not looking at this from a theory and it's conspiracy theory or any of that kind of standpoint. I'm looking at this like a, this is going to be a cool movie and it might actually give a small glimpse. If, if it's done right, it might give a small glimpse into what it's like over there um, in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and all those kind of things where you don't know if the civilian that's coming up to your vehicle is going to detonate a hidden bomb or if they just want to come up and see you. Yeah, there was um there was another Navy SEAL movie made a while ago. I forget what it's called. Do you guys remember? Which one? It actually had Navy SEALs playing Navy Active SEALs. Active Valor. Yeah, Active Valor. Active Valor, yeah. That was... A lot of people are saying that was a lot similar to it, but I still didn't watch that movie, it, so I don't from know. A, from an acting standpoint, it was terrible. Well, Active Valor was much more... Um, Active Valor wasn't about ambiguity. I yeah. Mean, Active Valor was a very much gung-ho yeah. Navy SEAL movie. Whereas... So it was just a big, dumb, kaboom, pew-pew movie, basically. Pretty kind much. Of was, yeah. Where they're like, oh, and, if we uh, put Navy SEALs as the actors, it'll make it more realistic. Yeah. Which, yeah. And, and the thing with American Sniper is, I think... Because uh, something that Clint Eastwood is very good at as a director and a producer is the ambiguity of war. Because if <laughs> you remember the companion pieces, Letters from Iwo Jima and uh, Flags of Our Fathers that came out didn't really paint either side as being evil or at least completely evil. Like, yeah, that's true. Because the Japanese side of it, Letters from Iwo Jima, was all about how these guys are soldiers too and you know, they're fighting for their homelands, they're fighting for various reasons and you know they are, they are not terrible people. Yeah. And they're just forced into the situation where they have to, they have to fight. And I think Clint Eastwood is very good at recognizing that war is ambiguous. And I think he's going to be bringing that style into American Sniper and saying, listen, you know, we're over there and these guys have no idea what's going on. And that's the thing with the contemporary war, you know, why you have so much post-traumatic stress disorder and whatnot is because there's no uniformed enemy. Yeah, it's true. So I, I, I'm hoping that American Sniper is really going to pound that point home in the movie and the trailer definitely seem to be uh heading in that direction but we'll see what happens when it comes out yeah it'll be uh yeah it'll be interesting uh clint eastwood you know he was in the army and he was uh drafted for the korean war and all that stuff so he was there like actually in a war so it'll be interesting to see his perspective of how like the actual current conflict right now overseas is going in the middle east yeah and i I think it'll be i didn't know he uh 
he came from the Pacific Northwest. That's interesting. Yeah, Pacific Northwest, <laughs> just like you, man. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Lee, Clint Eastwood, and me. <laughs> yeah, too bad the last one there kind of sucks. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> It's better than all the brilliant people who have come from New York, eh? Uh, <laughs> listen, New York is a state that has some good things about it. And then some, <laughs> some. Uh, some other things that I'm not too much a fan of. But! <laughs> yeah, let's just leave it at but, that. <laughs> but, but at least, finally, at least finally, there will be an AR-15 selection with a detachable magazine. Woot woot! That is true. First time since the SAFE Act. I am excited. The Ares SCR. Listen. America's sport rifle. I I know it's not a proper AR-15. I know it lacks the pistol grip and all that other kind of stuff. But I am still excited because having an AR-15 compatible rifle that can still have an attachable magazine in New York State without needing registration... Uh, and you know, obviously, without needing me to have bought it before April of twenty, uh, before January of twenty thirteen, is still a good thing. Yeah, it hits all the check marks, and it doesn't uh, like if let's say I wanted to buy one just because I I think the design's interesting, and I probably would buy one if they weren't so damn expensive. It's it's not like you know I can't use my thirty rounders in it if I want to, like with a lot of different types of New York guns yeah, well, or New York and safe that's the guns. Thing with anyway. it is. It's a design that, looking at it, I don't find unattractive. Yeah, it's been growing on me. When it first came out, I thought it looked very strange, and I really didn't like it. It kind of reminded me of those uh, revolving rifles. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Time, you know, where people still use revolvers. But, yeah, but it's just, <laughs> I was always more of a lever-action fan. So, uh, just the design, it was initially really unappealing to me, but as time has gone on, I, I'm really starting to like it. I'm kind of wondering what it would look like with an upper with a uh, forward assist and a brass deflector on it. Probably look pretty good. What's what's the name of it again? Ares SCR. The Ares SCR, man. Oh, he's got to Google it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I haven't. Seen, I actually haven't even looked at it. I, yet. I guess I guess you people in the free states haven't been following yeah, it as much. I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of my 40 round mags. Let me give you the two links I had open about it because I don't know anything about it either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I'm excited about is because I definitely want one. I'm going to get one uh, at least before this mm-hmm. summer. But, you know, I want to get the SCR lower kit that comes with the bolt carrier. Mm-hmm. And I want to get an aero precision upper that comes with an aero precision upper receiver, comes with a one and eight twist barrel. Uh, then I'll have to, you know, weld a, uh, weld a thread protector on there so that it doesn't have a threaded yeah. barrel. Uh, but, you know, I'll have a key mod rail system. I'll have, you know, a monolithic uh, upper rail. I'll have AR-15 magazine compatibility. I'll be able to shoot uh, 5.56 five, or I could get a bolt. And and that's the thing because it's an AR-15 practically. Yeah. It is limited to, you know, normal AR-15 uppers. So I couldn't get like a 308 upper and put that on there yet. I hope they release one. That would be They probably sweet. will make a 308 model at some point. I wouldn't see why not. That would be awesome, and I want one. So this thing just, it's like a lower receiver built like a, a rifle, but it allows you to bolt on AR uppers? Yeah, that's, that's that exactly what it is. Um, the, it is. Only, the only thing that's you can't cool. use from an AR upper is the uh, the, the bolt, bolt carrier, carrier group. group. Yeah. The, that's the bolt uh, carrier proprietary. But... It's got its own special charging handle, I think. No, the, the charging handle is fine. The charging handle yep, is... Yep, uses the same charging handle. It has a different uh, buffer. Yeah. That's about it, and otherwise it's cut in half from a normal bolt. Yeah, group. I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the bolt right now. That's kind of an interesting concept. Well, you know what it is? It's literally the same bolt concept that's used in Remington auto loading shotguns. Yeah, it is. It's very very similar. Um, I'm looking at it on uh, Ares Defense's actual website, and it looks like it's going to be available in two two three and five five six, and also seven six two by thirty nine. And um, at let's see, where was this? I think this was Shot Show. Well, the MSRP on it is uh, eight hundred and fifty to uh, eight hundred and seventy-five dollars for the uh, complete. Is that rifle. a full rifle or just the just the lower the complete thing? rifle? Okay, that's not bad. And the full rifle comes with a stripped sporter upper receiver, not like stripped, yeah. but like uh, you know, it doesn't have a forward assist or a brass deflector, uh, but it comes with the upper receiver, a one in nine chrome lined pencil barrel. And a Magpul MOE end with a low-pro uh, gas block. Yeah, so it comes with pretty much everything you need. Um, 
what I was saying about it being at the gun shows, you know, it takes a 223 and 556 as well as 762 by 39, but also they displayed it with a uh, 300 blackout upper on it. And it could still technically take 6.8 because, yeah. you know, it uses the same upper. Well, or, don't you know, those use a different bolt, stuff. though, than a 556 carrier? Um, they might use a different bolt face, but you could probably get that replaced. I'm not personally sure. But yeah, no, the bolt face you can replace as long as it's still around that obviously works with uh, with everything else. Yeah, as I think basically as long as you can get a barrel for it, a different um, actual bolt for the tip of the bolt carrier group, and then um, the magazine can still fit in a two two three magazine. Uh, you can put any one of those calibers in there. Huh. Cool. So just like with an AR fifteen, more or less. Yeah. What I'm interested in is I wonder if they're going to come out with uh, aftermarket parts for the trigger group. And what the kind of trigger pull is from the factory. What I'm most curious about is if any uh, aftermarket manufacturers are going to come out with different stocks for it. Because yeah. I would adore a Magpul SGA looking stock for that thing. What I think might happen with it, as what happened with the uh, Keltec SU-16, is somebody made a pistol grip and a collapsible stock adapter for it. That would be really ridiculous, but also kind of interesting to see someone running one of these with that stock and grip adapter on it and also like a well, suppressor on it. Obviously, you couldn't run that in New York of, State. Of course not, but I'm... Which is why I want the SGA looking yeah, stock because yeah. I could still have that in New York State. Yeah, I mean, like, I... At at the price that it's at, I heard it listed before at closer to 1200 for the MSRP, but if it's about the Ooh. same price as just a normal AR-15, like, about the same price as an M&P-15, I'd probably... Even here in Washington, where I don't need any no, of dude, these look features. At, look at the website. You know? The MSRP on there is uh, no more than $900. Yeah, where I'm seeing it, it doesn't list the MSRP. Hold on. Let me uh, let me pull it up for you. And they're selling the lower kit for uh, $500, and it comes with the lower, the complete lower and, and the bolt. Oh, that would be pretty cool. So I can just swap the upper on my AR-15 between them. Yeah. Yeah, you could literally just buy you know, for $500 the lower. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going to buy the lower kit. Uh, then I just need a 5.56 five, bolt and a thread protector for the arrow precision upper I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. Well, is it going to come with the 2.23 bolt? I don't know. Actually, let me look that up because uh, the Ares SCR lower. Yeah, because if it does come with the 2.23 bolt, you can you can still use 5.56 five, with that bolt. Well, yeah, obviously, because yeah. it just needs that for the... Uh, for the rim of the case. The, what's it called? Extractor. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the thing that I'm really looking forward to is really... Uh, that obviously that's what that's what i want is that lower and that upper from aero precision that's what i that's what i needs that's what i want in my life yeah you know other than that all i've been seeing at shot show is mostly just like new manufacturers making ar-15s like no one but aries has really been putting out anything in my opinion super remarkable this year have you looked at any of aries other stuff they have a shrike style uh upper well, Ares Defense is the original maker of the Shrike. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah so they have a. They have it's strikes, a new. They it's have a new style kind of for the Shrike. Yep, they've got the new gen going out. That's cool. Oh, there actually is one other gun that I think is kind of remarkable coming out: the Keltec RDB, where they took the RFB and they fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that that's the happen. So we hope, hilarious. right? So we hope. Well. It has an ejection port, like a proper ejection port. It doesn't spit rounds out the front. Huh. And that's kind of what that needed. Yeah. We hope. <laughs> yeah. That was Aside one of the, the biggest problems with the uh, with the RFB is that it doesn't have a side ejection port. It spits out the front, and that gets clogged up. Now, obviously, uh, real quick for anyone still listening, we have gone from video games to firearms very abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> we do that. <laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of what this podcast does. We're we're gun guys who like video games. Stay tuned. We might switch to knives real quick. Oh yeah, too. no kidding. <laughs> but I wish I could get the Keltec. You know how yeah. that goes. Yeah. Well, I can. So I'm gonna talk about it. <laughs> yeah, technically I could fix the magazine, but then how would I reload it? Are bull pups safe compliant? Nope. Yeah. So then uh, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> now, if they made a bull pup that did not have a pistol grip and had a target crowned barrel I could get it. Oh but god. They don't because that's kind of impossible. That would be disgusting looking as well. Yes, it would. It would be horrific. Now what I could get is a bullpup SKS because SKS is a stripper clip fed, not detachable magazine fed. Well, it depends on which one, but yes. 
Well, yeah, you can get kits for it, and then there are certain uh, SKSs that are actually engineered to use AK mags, but those are uh, not what most people think when they think about yeah. uh, SKS. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm talking about the traditional stripper clip fed SKS. Yeah. Like a, a Russian or Chinese one or something like that. Yes, or even a Yugo one. Yeah, I have a Yugo one. They're actually really fun to shoot, but that rifle stock... My buddy has a Yugo SKS, which is pretty fucking awesome. Does he have the Tapco stick or, uh, stock for it? Kit? Stock no, he kit? Does not. Okay, he yeah. just has the standard Yugo. Oh, yeah, you, you fucking SKS. can't. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, you can, with because, again, it's a stripper clip fed SKS. Well, the, the, so, tap, yeah, the Tapco uh, changes it to a magazine fed one. Well, then, no, you can't have that. You Sorry, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have the original stock on mine. And, God, 762 by 39 semi-automatic with a rifle stock sucks. It just, Not it really. bucks. Like, A, in, in yeah. my opinion, anyway, you know. I much prefer two vertical gripping points on a rifle, but... I don't know. I might be, I might be a bit weird, but... It really doesn't bother me because uh, maybe I'm just too used to it because I, I have my Sega Sporter in 7.62 by 39 is obviously my reference point for this kind of you stuff. You know, it could be. And the uh, the most common semi-automatic rifle that I've fired a lot is the AR-15. So I'm definitely used yeah. to like a vertical rear gripping position and just set up like an assault rifle. So I'm much more used to uh, controlling recoil that way than I am with an actual bolt-action rifle kind of stock, you know, like an old hunting rifle stock. Yeah. But, you know, that's just preference, of course, so. I mean, here's the thing. Like, I have shot my buddy's pre-safe act AK-47, his Yugo AK. Uh, actually, I think he has a Romanian AK. I don't fucking know. It's a Wasser. What are Wassers? Uh, Usually... Those are Belgian? Really? No, I thought those were Yugoslavian. No, Wassers aren't. I don't fucking know. Uh, Bulgarian. Sometimes, not very often. Wassers are Romanian. Okay. <laughs> well, point is, I shoot my buddy's uh, AK that's a Wasser, and it's got the donkey dick foregrip, and it's got the pistol grip, and it's got the normal layout like an AK-47 with the donkey dick foregrip. And I honestly don't prefer it compared to my Sega. People shit talk the donkey dick, dude. That is a good foregrip. I, I don't know why the donkey dick is a well done Cannot foregrip. It's, just, it. it's a well done foregrip and it feels very natural, especially to, you know, Eastern European mongoloids who have been used to manhandling donkey dicks. <laughs> <laughs> well then. I just like it because of the angle. It makes controlling recoil with that thing super easy. Yeah, but the thing is, like, I shoot it and the stock is too short for me. The pistol grip is too small for me. Well, I don't. And the sight is too. The sights are too low. In the low poor for me. gun's defense, it's not made for your Sasquatch of a man physique. That's true. <laughs> uh, AK stocks are also built for aiming up a hill. So if you're, if you ever notice when you're kind of shooting at a static target in front of you, just a normal position, it feels kind of weird. The cheek weld's kind of off. If you tilt the gun up, it's perfect. I've noticed that ever since, like, with airsoft guns. It's just they're designed for charging up hills. <laughs> oh, God, don't mention airsoft oh, no. guns. We're going to have all of ARFCOM coming in here and saying how we're so gay. Yeah, we're well, all... Uh, back to the RDB. Uh, their, <laughs> <laughs> their other rifle they showed off at SHOT Show, what was that, two years ago? The M43? Uh, that's something uh, I wouldn't mind having, the wooden steel version of it, basically. Versus yeah, the, not the, the uh, waffle plastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool because the M43, like, it looks like something that they pulled out of, like, a Nazi workshop from World War II. Or, you know, like, a gun or that like was a, supposed uh, to hit the field, but was never used. Or, like, a, uh, yeah, like an alternate timeline thing from World War II on. Yeah. Well, there was an old school British bullpup, actually, uh, that was around, if I recall correctly, around World War II era. And it was a British wood and steel bullpup. And I don't remember exactly what the name of it was, but it was in this book I used to have. Uh, and it was a thing that briefly existed. I don't even know if it ever saw service, but it existed. The EM2 rifle number nine, Mark one, or Jansen rifle. It's, yeah, it's one of those two. I think it was the rifle number nine or something That's, like that. Those are all and different names for the same gun. <laughs> it was in yeah, service yeah. in 1951. Uh, they produced 59 of them. So... Not not well, much. They were 10 away from the fun number. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> <laughs> We're mature. Totally. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's the thing. Is, uh, it, it looks like one of those. And that, that's fucking cool because that's a really weird gun that I would love to get my hands on just because, yeah, I've got one of these. And it's so weird and dumb and no one knows what it is, but it's awesome. It's got such a weird, like, uh, default optic on it. It's like a little cone that sits between the rear sight and front sight from what I can see from the picture anyway. And it's just oh what you mean like the you mean like the normal British standard of optics <laughs> pretty much but it's like physically just a steel cone it like I guess it limits uh, like peripheral vision or something like that and that's a huge no no for modern guns but you know World War Two they're still getting that shit figured out yeah, yeah they I were mean, you watch the old training videos with the handgun <laughs> yeah they, don't they don't aim with the sights people. aim along the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> They literally told people not to use the sights on the handgun, and they told them to put the barrel in line with your forearm and point at what you're trying to shoot. Mm -hmm. And these days, you've got every instructor saying, your sights guide your shooting. Use your sights whenever possible. Not sunny. It's so opposite. Not yeah. sunny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sunny Pazitas. <laughs> oh, man. That fucking video of him spinning in a circle shooting, that's just getting more and more infamous every day. It's just... I don't I don't know if someone actually did use that in real life or not, but just holy shit. <laughs> so unsafe. I, I mean the thing is, like people say, oh well, you know, there's range safety and then there's, you know, the real world, and I'm like, yeah, but just because you're in the middle of a combat situation doesn't mean that you're surrounded by threats in every direction that you want to be shooting. Well, I mean, not I guess necessarily in the situation could, he described but... it's possible, but <laughs> Again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a service man. I don't really have the, uh, I don't have the wherewithal. To yeah, that's the thing, you know, such things. none of us have real combat experience. The closest thing any of us has come is like paintball and airsoft. So we're probably never going to have to aim a gun at another human being or receive fire. But we some hope. stuff just, it, yeah, we hope. But it, it just looks silly. And when you hear actual combat veterans talk about, you know, like most of combat is hiding behind good cover. It's just seeing people do that kind of tactic. It's like, what action movies are you watching before you get yeah. out of the barracks in the morning, dude? Yeah. Like, seriously. But, hey, maybe some Spetsnaz guy used it somewhere, and uh, he survived a situation, killed every Op 4 in the region. Who knows? Yeah, and he lived to tell the tale. I mean, maybe. I don't know. He lived uh, to tell I Sony, at least. <laughs> All I know is that if a technique is too dangerous to practice... It's probably too dangerous to use. Yeah, and you could always make the argument of like, well, if your life is in danger, then nothing is too dangerous to get yourself out of the situation, whatever. But yeah, it's just kind of up to opinion. It looks silly to me. And if I'm hanging out at a range with my friends, I don't want to see one of them start doing a tornado, like a tornado of bullets moving down range. It's not <laughs> what I want to be near. So. If I'm at a range and I see someone doing the tactical twirl, I am immediately leaving that range. Yeah, yeah. probably calling the cops too. <laughs> yeah. So. Because let's face it, what kind of range would allow someone to practice that? Not I a go good to a one. range where they wouldn't care, but that's different. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that they're breaking the rules; it's that there's no rules. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a little hard to break me, rules. I shoot are, mostly on private land. Yeah. Because dealing with idiots at firing ranges is certainly an interesting experience. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about the SCR, we've talked about the RDV, the M43, that British Janus rifle thing. So yeah. how about we go to knives now? Hey. And we talk right, about from... New York Knife Maker uh, and yeah, his he, new uh... stuff. <laughs> the In God We Trust Knives. You know, it, it's one yeah. of those things where. I, you know, I know Ryan, you know, and he's mm -hmm. a really nice guy. You know, he's a great guy, but the knife community seems to have a weird thing with religion. Yeah. Um, some knife makers are very, very much about, you know, religion. And, you know, obviously none of us are all that religious. Um, yeah. If, if you're in a religion, it's, you know, perfectly fine. We're not saying that. It's just this, like, New York Knife Maker... At one point, he was basically giving people knives if they said that they believed in God to him, right? It was something like that you were telling me. Well, he uh, he was no, he was doing something where he was uh, he was just giving people knives because in his you know it, he was saying, oh well, you know, 
how much more, you know, what makes you more like Jesus than, you know, trying to uh, spread the spread gifts to people and spread the good word to people. And yeah. yeah. And the thing is, like, obviously, I respect what he does just because he's a really nice guy. And, you know, he is trying to do what he uh, what is, you know, what it is to him the right thing and what his religion is telling him is the right thing. But the thing is, it comes off as a little crazy. Yeah, if you're someone from outside of the knife community, like if if you're just uh, if you're somebody who's got like 300 bucks to burn on a really good knife, and you're like, oh, I've heard about New York Knife Maker, and you're like, whatever, and you go to his website, and the banner now says, "In God We Trust Knives," and he's got things called the Jonah Harpoon and the Jesus Knife and the Genesis and the Judah Cleaver. It's it's kind of weird, you know. Yeah. Like I'm I'm expecting to see perlite grips with like uh, crucifixes like engraved in the sides or something in the next few weeks, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. It's just, it's one of those things where it's not, I'm going to just respectfully, uh, not really be behind that whole thing. Cause, and the thing is, he's a very talented knife maker. Yeah. I own, he is, you know, some of his pieces. He's very good. He's very talented and he loves what he does. Yeah. He's a very talented knife maker. And from, from what I've heard about him, he hasn't been on the knife scene for very long, but he's already outpacing a ton of people. Like he's, he's yeah, very he's, good at what he does, but yeah, it's just that, you know, he's, very much gotten into religion and uh it's just it's kind of off-putting to uh you know myself included honestly it's just kind of weird yeah and Um, you can you can always make the argument of like well you know these are his custom works he wants to put a lot of himself into it and a lot of something he sees as himself is his religion and that's fine but it's it's like trying to i don't know trying to put your personality into an item you're trying to commercialize is just kind of it's limited in the things you can do while retaining an audience. And that kind of makes me look at this as like, he doesn't care if he's selling knives. He just wants to make knives and that's totally respectable and everything. It's just, well, he's not a full-time knife maker. He does have a day job. Yeah. Which it um, would be very hard so, to make knives as a hobby and use that as your primary employee. Yeah. And, and you know, full-time knife makers are pretty few and far between of all the people who make knives. I mean, most successful knife makers make knives part time for many years before they go full time. Yeah. Like there's um there's a local guy who makes knives and I I totally forget his name, but I've shown you guys the website from it. He makes a lot of really great knives and he's gotten to the point where he can rent out a shop in an area, just make knives all day, sell that and turn a pretty good profit on it. But this guy is like I think he's 65 or 70 years old and he's been making knives since he was about 20 years old. It takes a yeah. while to get yourself out there as a presence to say, I've been making knives for decades. I make pieces of art. If you see a knife priced for $800, it's worth $800, you know? It's hard to... Well, you have a lot of guys now, like uh, Will Moon and uh, Michael Gavick, Gavco, uh, Tough Thumbs, uh, Tough Knives now who with uh, social media have become full-time knife makers pretty damn quickly because they get a following. They get a lot of people following their work and Mm -hmm. a lot of people want their work because they've seen their videos and they've seen, uh, you know, they've met them at uh, conventions and they've seen them at gatherings and get togethers and shot show and blade show and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So you can become a full-time knife maker quickly, but you know, then you have some issues that will pervade. Like uh, Will Moon is often criticized for his fit and finish and the way he handles uh, certain aspects of customer relations. Like he had some issues with Blade Forums where he made multiple accounts on Blade Forums to you know try to say you know from different fake accounts you know talk good about his knives and and that's the thing is you know you can get some issues with guys who haven't been it very long you know not presenting themselves necessarily the best way they can or having certain problems. Yeah. You just have to be careful about how you try to market what you're making. Yeah. And you know, the issue is, you know, with uh, Ryan and again, I really like Ryan, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to hate on Ryan, but you know, he's kind of put me off of uh, some of his work a little bit just because I don't share his depth of religious belief. And I think he sees a lot of, you know, the guys who follow alpha hunter tactical design, uh, a lot of the guys uh, who follow Mike Snowdy, you know, a lot of them are very deeply faithful and he wants to market his knives to them. So I want to talk about uh, Mike Snowdy, but before we get to that, um, Gavco, like you were saying, he has a huge social media presence. Like his YouTube channel is 
right near uh, 28,500 people. Yeah, he's got you know almost thirty thousand subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy for just a basically a backdoor knife maker. Yeah, so, but he's full time now. Yeah, ex- he like, doesn't have a day job. He lives in Florida and makes knives in his shop and sells those, and that's his job. That's what he does. Yeah, from this and from Facebook, he gets so much attention with that that he he's in a position where he can do this. Like his videos have a combined total of uh, six point seven million views. He's yeah. he's reaching a lot of people. So. But uh, yeah, Mike Snowdy. So his public presence is so weird. And you guys know my opinion on that. It's just like he presents himself as this like Jersey kind of Guido douchebag guy. But from everyone's accounts of everyone who's ever met him in person, he's apparently like the nicest guy ever. That's, and that's <laughs> the funny part. Because like I said, there was uh, Jim Skelton who at one point on a comment on one of his videos, Jim Skelton said, I will never put a dollar in Mike Snowdy's pocket. And then they met up at the USN gathering like three months after that. And Jim Skelton all of a sudden is all about Mike Snowdy. (laughs) Yeah. It's just, as soon as he meets him, he's like, Oh, I guess I was wrong about this guy. He's actually pretty cool. Yeah. And he likes Mike Snowdy. And now he's following Mike Snowdy on, you know, Instagram and Facebook. You know, he's commenting, he's promoting some of his stuff and he's, you know, talking to him. And Mike Snowdy made a big post talk about how he loves the energy that Jim Skelton brings to the custom knife game. And Jim Skelton is, uh, Jim Skelton is one of those guys who is a, he's purely a reviewer and he gets sent knives by guys to, uh, to review and to photograph and to talk about. And uh, he buys a lot of custom knives from a lot of people. Uh, he even for a while, I don't know if it's still going on for a while, he ran Diamond Jim's Live Knives Project and he got in a lot of knives from some makers and sold them on this show because in his I, you know he saw a lot of dealers and a lot of secondary market prices that were really inflated. And he was like, man, I'm gonna just have these on the show for what the dealers want what the makers want them sold for and I'm gonna sell them on there. Yeah. Um, something with Snowdy that, like, it's it's kind of disappointing to me, I guess, with a lot of his newer knives that he's been at least pushing on his Facebook page. It seems like he's trying to push for more like a, a niche, like, higher end knife market at this point. Like, before he kind of, he was kind of hitting the normal points that every kind of knife maker in that range would get but now he's like inlaying gems into his knives and he's making these like $900 balisongs and just all this stuff and like you guys have seen his Eclipse Ice right? The one where oh, he's yeah. actually inlaying gems into it I'm not sure if they're actual gemstones yeah. or not uh, he There's has it, something. He has it hashtag green diamonds so I'm guessing they are emeralds and diamonds so it's just you see this, and it's like, this is looking really tacky, at least from my perspective. It's and, just... and that's the thing, but for every one of those he uploads, I'll see one at a dealer, and it's got lightning strike carbon fiber handles and a satin finished blade, and it's going for, you know, seven or $800, which is, you know, still expensive, but... Yeah, but it's, it's, it's still in that fair tacky. range. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, I, I almost kind of wonder if that's like part of his character, you know, because he has that video persona where he puts in the fake grill and he acts like a D-bag and all this stuff. But he only seems to push the knives that like, in my opinion, they don't look very great. I'm sure they're perfect knives. I'm sure everything about them is great and whatever. But like a serrated balisong, who uses a serrated balisong? <laughs> yeah. He sold yeah, one. had the whole back serration and whatnot. It was kind of weird. Yeah, apparently he made one for somebody in the U.S. Border Patrol. That's cool. But just, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have too much room to criticize on it or anything. It's just, it comes across as kind of odd to me and a little bit off-putting. So well, I think Mike Snowdy, because uh, again, I've talked to Ryan about this. Uh, I think Mike Snowdy, well, I talked to Ryan about it, you know, before he started calling himself in God We Trust Knives. Yeah. Um, but he uh, he is very much, he just loves what he does. Like, he has a lot of fun with it. I think he has a lot of fun playing the gangster. Mm-hmm. And it really does come off as douchebaggy and off-putting. But apparently, like, you know, he's the type of guy who will play this persona and then go to conventions, go to get-togethers, and just be the nicest dude ever. And 
and everyone's shocked and like what the hell is with this guy yeah i mean it's it's just a character which is it's kind of clear to see but it's just it's really strange to see him using a character for marketing in this kind of market you know like no one very odd yeah everyone else who puts out knives in this kind of like you know homemade knife maker range that's just they tend to just be like who they are like with uh nykm you know he's he's being who he is and he's putting parts of his religion into things that he's making that's a little bit of an extreme like that but he's being himself for snowdy's advertisements he's he's playing this character and it's for me like i see his his non crazy looking knives and i'm like these are actually really good knives everyone has good things to say about him but when i see the ones that he's like putting up on facebook right now like the serrated ballast songs like i was talking about or he's putting up videos where he's got that like douchebag jersey kind of persona on and he's playing that character it's really off putting to someone like me so it's just yeah, yeah it's really <laughs> weird it's a weird duality um but that's why factory knives are nice, because there's not as much drama in the factory knife scene. Yeah, well, yeah, when you're just stamping out blades and having some guy in a nice house design a knife for you, it's a little different. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Sal Glesser from Spider Co. Uh, has, like, at some points on his forum, people will go on there and try to start drama. Like, uh, I think someone was talking about, like, some way that Benchmade or they were talking bad about Benchmade or something on one of Spider Coast forums and Sal Glesser chimed in on the forum and he said, listen, we don't you know, run this forum to talk ill of anyone else. Leave shiny footprints. And I really like Sal Glesser. Like I've never met him, unfortunately. I would love to. Um, I've never talked to him in depth, but everything I've ever read that he's put out and every interview I've ever seen with him Sal Glesser just comes across as one of those dudes who's like, listen, we make knives that we want to make. I mean, yes, they're factory knives, but we design them in a lot of cases. We collaborate with great designers. We love what we do, and we're just here to do what we do and make awesome shit. And I love Spyderco, so there we go. Yeah, they make some quite nice uh, quite nice knives. I've, even their, uh, their bird line, which is, that's their made in China line, isn't it? Yeah, the bird line, well, and they have their Tenacious series, which is made in China. Yeah. Um, you know, but, some of their other stuff. But even their bird, like, I had a uh, Caracara 2 for a long time. I think I still have it around somewhere in a box somewhere, but that was a really good knife for a while. Like, 8CR 13 MOV, it's not a, like we were talking about the other day, it's not a bad knife steal at all. Yeah, like it, it's cheap, but it's everything you need, nothing you don't. It's easy to sharpen, it's pretty well stainless. Uh, it's tough enough for everyday use, and it holds an edge throughout the day. Yeah, and um, I was I was hearing an interesting philosophy about knife edges from somebody and the kind of knife steel you use. Uh, they said that they would prefer to have a soft edge that they can resharpen on, like anything from like wood to rocks, than a really high carbon, super tough edge that you need sharpening tools for. And I'd never heard that before, but that's kind of an interesting point because if it's like a field or bushcraft knife, and you're in the middle of nowhere camping and suddenly your knife is starting to get dull would you rather be able to just rake a smooth rock across the blade and resharpen it or do you want to have to get out like a 2k grit hone and start like sanding it back out and getting it all super well, sharp Ernest like Emerson that? has a has another way of saying that Ernest Emerson uh, in talking about why he heat treats his uh, 154 cm steel at 57 to 59 instead of like 60 because uh, Emerson steel is pretty soft. Um, and his view on it is a dull knife is still usable. A broken knife is useless. Yeah, that's that's another good point for that. So it's just an interesting consideration for someone like me who's going to start trying to produce knives soon for uh, different kinds of steel I might be considering. So, Well, and, you know, different levels of heat treat. Cause, you know, exactly. Because you, you're talking about using 5160, which is a great steel, but then... You know, where do you want to heat treat it? Do you want to heat treat it 60 to 61 to try to get the best edge retention out of it? Or do you want to heat treat it, you know, 58 to 60, you know, try to get some of the balance? Or do you even want it at like, uh, I, I mean, 5160, I think is typically run, if I'm recalling correctly, somewhere in the neighborhood of 57 to 58. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. And that's, 
that's a thing that I'm going to have to consider, you know, when I'm actually heat treating it, I'm going to have to treat it to different levels like that to see what kind of HRC rating I really want to have it at. Because if it's... Well, and what HRC rating, you know, you'll get with different tempering, with different temperatures. Exactly, because since I'm not using an induction forge, I'm just using a crappy coffee can forge, I have to actually test it and see where all that stuff's going to get to. So... Yeah. So, okay, we've been going at this for about an hour and a half now, and we've covered a hell of a lot of stuff... Yeah. And so uh I think it's time to outro it. Probably. Yeah. So how do we want to outro? Peace bitches. <laughs> Peace bitches. <laughs> Until next time. Until next time. Peace bitches.